All right, let's talk about nucleic acids. So when you think of nucleic acids, you probably think of the two most common ones we talk about. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Notice ribo, that's ribose, except this is deoxyribo. Remember when we talked about carbohydrates, we talked about ribose and deoxyribose. This is referring to the fact that this one involves deoxyribose. Or RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, using ribose instead of deoxyribose. So these are also polymers. Uh, whereas proteins can be anywhere from dozens to thousands of amino acids long, nucleic acids can be significantly bigger, hundreds of millions of monomers long. Their monomer is the idea of a nucleotide. So a nucleotide has a particular structure. The general idea is that it is a sugar attached to a phosphate, also attached to a base. So phosphate, sugar, base. That's the basic concept of a nucleotide. Uh, I, can draw, I won't draw up the detailed structure of, ba of the base. They're a little more complicated. But I can draw this part up. So let's draw up a ribonucleotide. So that would involve ribose. Which is a five carbon sugar. This one is attached to the base, which I'm not going to get into the details of. If it's ribo, if it's ribose, this has an oxygen hydrogen rather than just a hydrogen. This carbon up here once had an oxygen hydrogen, but now what it's got is oxygen and then phosphorus. That's a phosphorus bound to actually four oxygen molecules, one of them with a double bond, and carrying some amount of negative charge. If this is bound to something else, one of those negative charges will be removed. But at sitting out here by on its own like this, it might have two. So this, is, this structure means that an individual nucleotide actually has, is very, very hydrophilic. It's got lots of polar bits and then some even charged bits, so the water is just fine with these. And these can then attach themselves to other nucleotides, just like anything where you're going from a monomer to a polymer. And here's how they do it. Just get rid of this stuff up here, give us a little more room to draw. The idea is that our next sugar, if we bring in another nucleotide, the phosphate will attach itself there to the sugar of the, on the previous one. Actually, sorry, not that one. This one. over there. So we end up getting this phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar arrangement. And the next nucleotide would attach itself eh, here. So again, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. Three nucleotides all attached together. This here we're building a strand, and that strand, as I mentioned, can get up to hundreds of millions of nucleotides long, if you're talking about some of the bigger pieces of DNA. Over here, if we're looking at this on this side of it, that would look like this oxygen attaching itself to this carbon. So there's that bond we just formed between the phosphate 
and one of the carbons on the next sugar. So that's the idea of nucleotides joining together. In this case, what we've made is a piece of RNA, ribonucleic acid, because these are involving the sugar ribose. Now, what these nucleic acids are good for, actually the individual nucleotides are themselves useful. So for example, there's one molecule where we have a nucleotide using the base adenine, and then attached to its phosphate, we stick two more phosphates on it. That, a mo that modified nucleotide is also known as adenosine triphosphate, usually just abbreviated ATP, which you've probably heard of. ATP is the energy carrying molecule that our body uses to fuel processes that need cellular energy. We burn glucose to make ATP and then use ATP to pay the energy cost for things in the cell that need it most of the time. But that's just that's a use of a single nucleotide. What we what we usually think about with nucleic acids is long strands of those nucleotides. And what they do is carry information. They carry it based on what bases are on the nucleotides. So in DNA, there are four bases we can have. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. So if I've got my sugar phosphate backbone here, so phosphate and sugar phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. On each sugar, I'll have one of those four bases. Let's put this one as an adenine, a cytosine, a guanine, and a thymine. So there's four nucleotide bases. Now, the special thing about these bases is that if I have another strand here, It actually has to be arranged the other direction, whereas this one ends in the phosphate here, this one has to end in the phosphate here. If these have the right bases on them, they'll match with this. So if this one is, if there's a thymine on this side, that will actually match nicely with an adenine here. They actually form two hydrogen bonds. Their shapes match in such a way that they form hydrogen bonds with each other. Likewise, if there's a cytosine, that will match with a guanine. So this guanine would match with the cytosine. Guanine cytosine forms three hydrogen bonds, and this thymine will match with an adenine. These are base pairing. That's special because if I took these apart, I could assemble a copy on each one. If I pulled this strand over here that said A, C, G, T, since I know that T goes with A, I could build T, G, C, A. And when I built, took this one apart, I could build A, C, G, T, and then I would have two identical pieces of DNA. That base pairing allows us to make copies of this molecule, even if it's very, very, very long. The cellular machinery needed to do that is complex, but it's just machinery, it's just molecules, and it's really, really awesome how it works. We're not going to get into the details of that, unfortunately. But if you've taken basic biology, you'll have had it in there. And if not, take it sometime. It's really worth learning about. Anyway, so that's how DNA can make copies of itself. It also is how it stores information. So if we now we need to talk a little bit about RNA. RNA uses almost the same bases. It uses the adenine, cytosine, guanine, but instead of thymine, it uses one called uracil. But uracil acts like thymine. It matches with the adenine. So what I can do is, if I've got a strand of a double-stranded set of DNA, if I peel them apart, I can assemble a single strand of RNA to match one of the strands, and then that single strand of RNA will have a particular sequence of bases then there's other machinery in the cell made of a combination of protein and RNA called a ribosome 
that can take that piece of RNA and interpret it, take it three bases at a time and read that and know what order to put amino acids into a protein. So the sequence of bases here in this DNA actually is instructions for how to build polypeptides, for what order to put amino acids into a protein. And as we saw earlier, the order of the amino acids determines the shape and function of the protein. So your DNA is partially recipes for making protein. Other parts of the DNA, based on how they stick to each other, aren't, seem to be involved in regulating which parts of the DNA get made, and some parts of it we don't know what they're for, a lot of it actually. But at least one major part of DNA is instructions for making protein. When you hear the word of it, when you hear something called a gene, a gene is a sequence of DNA that contains instructions to make a protein. Kind of cool, really. Honestly, breathtakingly cool, to be honest. So anyway, that's what nucleic acids are for, mostly. Storing information, copying information, and translating that information into other structure in the cell, like proteins. Pretty neat. Alrighty, now, now that we've gone over that, let's go into our last category of biomolecules, which is lipids. And unlike the other three categories, lipids are not polymers. Lipid molecules are not made of many copies of smaller things. Some of them are made of a few, but we do not consider these polymers. So we're going to talk about several kinds of lipids. We're going to talk about fatty acids and a modification of fatty acids called icosanoids. We'll talk about triglycerides and phospholipids. And we'll talk about sterols. More often, we talk about steroids. So let's get into fatty acids. I'll give you a moment in case you want to take note of that. So the basic structure of a fatty acid is a long molecule, one end. is one of these, remember that from the amino acid? What's it called? Carboxyl, or a carboxylic acid group. That is then attached to a long chain of carbons. How many carbons in this chain varies. Uh, the total carbon chain, including the carboxylic acid, will in humans almost always have an even number of carbons, but it could be anywhere up to more than 20 carbons long. These carbons will usually have just hydrogens on them. Oop, that should have one more carbon to be valid. There we go. All right, so that is an example of a fatty acid. Specifically, this is a, what we call, saturated fatty acid because all of the carbons here have single bonds between them and each carbon has two hydrogens on it. You can have examples where some of the carbons will have double bonds, something like this. Uh, this would be the bad kind, this would be a trans fat, but this is an unsaturated fatty acid where there's at least one double bond between some of the carbons. Uh, not a whole lot of difference, I mean they, it does make a difference, it changes the shape of the fatty acid a little bit, but we're not going to get too into that right now. What I want to talk about at the moment is some of the characteristics that this has. So take a look at this structure and tell me. Overall, is this polar or nonpolar? This is the kind of question you might be asked on an exam. So take a, take a moment to think about that. Is this a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? Now, when I look at this, I see two things. Up here, I see, all right, there's a couple of things that are fairly polar. 
So that part right there has some places where water can associate with it. But the entire rest of this molecule is nothing but nonpolar bonds, bonds between little sisters, carbon to carbon or carbon to hydrogen. All of that being nonpolar makes this whole thing altogether pretty nonpolar, therefore lipophilic. Fat loving, which makes sense because that's fat. Uh, it's a small, it's a portion of what we usually consider fat. Anyway, so this, you do find free fatty acids sometimes, just fatty acids on their own, but more often you find them as part of other things or modified. So keep this in mind, but then we're going to talk about what we do with them. One thing is that 20 carbon fatty acids can be turned into a kind of molecule called an icosanoid. They're modified to turn them into icosanoids. And icosanoids are a modified fatty acid that's usually used as a messenger molecule. So these can be used as hormones or as molecules that are messaged from one cell directly to another nearby cell or just into the local environment. So for example, you may have heard of prostaglandins, which are involved in the inflammation response, among other things. Prostaglandins are icosanoids. They're messenger molecules that are modified fatty acids. There's others like thromboxanes are also icosanoids and several other examples. So I just wanted to mention that fatty acids can be, some fatty acids can be made into these important signal and message molecules called icosanoids. The other couple other things we often think about when we talk about what we do with fatty acids, one of them is how fatty acids are usually found in food and in the body, which is the idea of a triglyceride. This is actually one way they're found in the body. The other one is actually probably even more common. A triglyceride, look at the name, tri implies three, is a molecule called glycerol. So here I'm just gonna draw, this is glycerol. But in a triglyceride, we're going to modify this a little bit. To make a triglyceride, we're going to bring in a fatty acid. So here's the fatty acid with its long chain of hydrocarbons. We're just going to draw the carboxyl here. And we are going to, using a dehydration reaction, remember that from when we made protein, take off this hydrogen and this hydroxyl group. Those are going to come over here and make water. And what's left, we're going to get this. My fatty acid is going to get stuck onto this glycerol. So what we have here is one fatty acid on a glycerol. We can do the same with two more fatty acids and make a triglyceride. Triglycerides are what we usually think of as fats. When you find fat in dietary foods like oils or the fats around meats, that's triglycerides. That's how we find these there. And when your body stores fat, it's stored in the form of triglycerides. So adipose tissue is cells with big, big bubbles in them containing lots of triglyceride. It's used for other things in the body too. And in the body, triglyceride is useful as, a in, as thermal insulation, keeps, helps to keep heat inside the body, whether you want to or not. Um, it's useful for cushioning organs. It provides a little bit of physical protection, and it's a good energy source. We'll talk later in the muscular system about how we can use fatty acids and triglycerides for production of energy. So that's the idea of a triglyceride. Now, one more thing you can do with these, if for this third one, Instead of adding a fatty acid, I'm going to take this and rotate it so the, this hydrogen is sticking down and the oxygen sticking up here. If here what we do is add a phosphate, usually some other stuff stuck onto that phosphate, what we've made is what's called a phospholipid. A phospholipid 
has some really interesting characteristics. So when we looked at the triglyceride, we could look at that and say that's almost entirely lipophilic. That's, water's not going to like that. And we know that. Water and oil don't mix well. But look at this. We've got this thing with these two big lipophilic tails, and the glycerol itself is pretty lipophilic. But then up here you've got this charged thing, and charged things are strongly hydrophilic. This is a good example of that term we talked about earlier, something which has a hydrophilic part and a lipophilic part, which is we call amphipathic. Sometimes you might draw this as having a sort of a hydrophilic head that's the phosphate mostly, and lipophilic tails. Put that in water, and the water's going to cluster around this side, but avoid this side. Put a bunch of them in water, and think for a moment about what those might do. So let's take a moment to think about what happens if you put one of these in water, or actually if you put a bunch of these in water. So as we mentioned, the water can associate with this charged hydrophilic head, but not with the tails, which means that the tails will tend to cluster together. And there's really two ways that that could go. You could end up with a structure where the tails are all in the middle, and the hydrophilic heads are all on the outside with the water out here. That works. Or, you can end up with a structure where the tails cluster together in a longer sheet. With the heads on both sides, so now there can be water here and here. This can end up... forming an area where there can be water on the inside and water on the outside, and then this sort of waterproof lipophilic membrane around it. This structure we call a phospholipid bilayer, and that's going to be very important when we talk about cell membranes. So keep that in mind. We'll get back to that. All right, so that's most of the categories of lipids. <clears throat> now let's talk about the last one, sterols. Sterols are all, they all come from the same basic structure. I'm not going to draw it on here. I'll see if I can put up a copy um, in the recording. But they are all based on that. It has that distinctive four ring structure. And if you take a look at it, you can see that with the exception of, say, a hydroxyl group on the one I'm showing there, this is entirely lipophilic. The structure you're seeing, all of the uh, little sticks represent carbon to carbon bonds. Each junction or end of a stick is a carbon. And there are hydrogens everywhere, although they're not shown. In, in some cases, they're not shown. So all of that is just nonpolar bonds, except for that one OH on it, which means it's pretty much entirely lipophilic. And that particular structure actually goes very well in one of those phospholipid bilayers. It fits nicely between those fatty acid tails. So that structure there is cholesterol, which is an important part of cell membranes and affects those cell membranes in interesting ways, which we'll talk about a little bit when we talk about cell membranes. That's one of the most important sterols, and it can be we take that and use it to make various steroids, which are hormones. So things like estrogen progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, um, aldosterone, all of these are various kinds of steroid hormones. And you're probably familiar with at least some of them. These have powerful and wide-ranging effects on the body. One of the reasons they are so powerful is because they're based on that structure, they can slip through phospholipid bilayers, which, as we mentioned, are the major component of cell membranes. So these messenger chemicals can pass straight into and out of our cells. 
Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the cell is going to respond to them, but it means that if they're there, they can get into the cell and may be able to cause a response. So steroids are pretty interesting. When we get to the endocrine system and a few other systems, we'll talk a little more about how steroids work. Uh, endocrine, reproductive, and urinary both make big, all make big uses of steroids. Alrighty. So that's about it for lipids. The, in the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the concept of enzymes. And that's not exactly a separate biomolecule. Enzymes are all proteins, occasionally with some other stuff stuck added to them. But it's still an important thing to talk about at this point because now we're still talking about biochemistry and enzymes play a huge role in making our biochemistry work.